Welcome everyone to the last day of NAB here at the Maxon booth. We are showcasing artists from around the world and how they use Maxon One in their creative workflows. I'm here with the pillar of the community, Chris Schmidt, the Rocket Lasso himself, doing Rocket Lasso Live. So I'll let you take it from here and I will jump in and try and grab more questions for you. So, awesome. welcome. Hello everybody, I'm Chris Schmidt and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live. Um, special live from NAB edition. So everybody here in the audience, any questions that you have, I'm going to be grabbing them from you. Um, anything, technical challenges, things you've been thinking about lately. Uh, a, an extra focus on new features would be cool, but it doesn't have to be. And if we don't have any questions, I'll just start showing off new features. Um, so a couple of quick things as we go. Uh, I'm from Rocket Lasso, where we make plugins. And we've got a whole bunch of plugins out there now for Ricochet, for bouncing around objects and Slicer for slicing up objects and creating splines out of them, or even flat geometry and all those different pillars, really cool for lots of different effects. Uh, and mesh to spline is super, super useful. And keep an eye out, we got a new plugin coming out probably within a month, and we just started working on a new one as well, so excited for that one. Uh, we also do live streams, this is one of them. Every week at pretty much this time on Wednesday, I do a two hour live stream from Twitch and from YouTube where I take questions live from the chat. I have no idea what's coming, we just make it up as we go and I just you know, love helping the community, finding what everybody else is working on and you know, just putting it out there into the world. And lastly, we also do tutorials, We've got lots of tutorials online. If you look at all the tutorials from Rocket Lasso in the GSG days, I've got like over 600 hours of content online with tutorials and live streams combined, so it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, a couple of few, uh, a few announcements here. Uh, first of all, Hafrez. Uh, Hafrez 2022 is going to be on September 9th of this year. If you don't know what Hafrez is, it is a one night conference that we do in Chicago. It's an extension of Chicago C4D, which is a user group that I run there, which is just awesome people, a very similar crowd to what we would have here at NAB in general. That type of people coming, hanging out, couple presentations, just hanging out, networking, meeting people, students meeting studios, studios meeting students, uh, lots of uh, friends coming together and meeting uh, all the new people who are getting into the industry. Um, so you should head on over to halfres.com, save the date, and join the newsletter so when we start releasing tickets, uh, you can go and grab them. Uh, one more thing is we have an NAB sale. So all those plugins I was mentioning, you can get them for 25% off for the next couple days, just the week of NAB, by going to gumroad.com slash rocket lasso and use the code NAB2022. So 25% off is pretty much the best price you're going to get on any of our stuff. So you should definitely take the opportunity if you've been thinking about using any of them. But anyway, uh, you can follow at Rocket Lasso on all the different platforms, but let's get into Rocket Lasso Live properly. So, does anybody have any questions that jump out at you right away? Don't be shy. So, with the new rope tools, if you wanted to make like really complex, um, like uh, kind of cloth simulations of the clothing, how would you go about doing that? Uh, okay, so the question is. Using some of the rope stuff and the cloth stuff, like how would we maybe start going about doing some clothing? So I can actually step through a project that we s talked a little bit about the other day. Let me pull this up and find uh, the clothing file, but we'll kind of start from scratch on it. So I'll delete out, oop, not the character, instead I'll delete out the shirt and the pants, and we'll just keep this model. Okay, so. What do we got here? I'm going to hide that for a second. Very simple setup. I have a, get rid of that. I've got a mesh here, and it's a nice clean mesh. This is actually something I brought over from Mixamo, but I wanted it to have like really clean polygons. So I fed, <coughs> I fed it into the new Z remesher. So just to show that process a little bit, um, if I feed this into this brand new tool, well, we've had the remesh, but now we have a new algorithm inside of it. So one of the best features from ZBrush is now directly inside of Cinema 4D. So throwing that model into the Z mesh, I can change the mesh density. So let's drop, you know, drop this down to like 25%, and instantly we're going to get a very clean, low poly version. Because it's a character, we could turn on this symmetry, and if now it's perfectly mirrored left and right. You can get real weird if you do a symmetry on Y. So that'll mirror both of those. So yeah. So remeshing that, I got uh, the low poly version, and I was able to apply that remeshed version uh, and bake it down as a new character. Actually, we'll do that. I'm going to delete out 
Oh, no, he moves to a different spot, so let's not do that. Uh, anyway, I just remapped it onto the same skeleton, the same joints that we already had. So now I've got a simple character. If I hit play, you're going to see that it's a looping, jumping animation. But an important thing I did, if you're going to do clothing, is probably your character is going to have to start out in some sort of like A pose or T pose, because obviously you can't model clothing if it's in um, if he's in some kind of crazy crouched position or something. But and and the, even if you ran the simulation and he's going to be down in a different spot and you did add clothing, the natural state of that model is going to be like all bent and twisted. So if there's any say stiffness to the cloth, it's going to be like, well, I want this wrinkle to always be here. So we have to start out with the character in a T pose and. Not too slowly, but you know, transition him into the final or the actual beginning. So in this case, my I wouldn't want my animation to start until about frame 30. So everything before that is just getting it into the proper position. So having said all that, uh, let's make a well. Here's a copy of that model, and I'll hide the current animated one. So here's just like that same raw mesh. So if we want to make a, I'm going to make a shirt here. And I've already got a couple of selections here, so I'm going to keep it simple for myself. Just select, let me zoom up a bit, and select right there. And then UF for fill, and I'll click to select everything in the torso area. Um, and let's turn that into the shirt. Actually, let's get rid of one. No, we'll leave those on the corner. That's fine. OK, so I want to split this off as a separate model. So I'll hit the shortcut UP, and uh, that's just a split command. So now I've got the original model unmodified, which I can hide. And now I've got this new model, which is this shirt. So bringing back the original character. Uh, why don't I make this character blue, just so that they're popping out from each other. And first what I got for you is the internet questions. Oh, look at that. So just right there. If you need, you can put it where you want. The screen will stay on the whole time. OK, thank you. OK, so uh, I've now got what would be a new shirt. So I'll just rename that so I don't mix it up. And test right test now, it's perfectly one, in the exact same spot. You don't want those polygons test overlapping. Test. So hitting the letter D for extrude, shortcut there, I can extrude those out. So let's go real subtle on it, so just a little bit. So now we know they're not intersecting. We should be careful, because I did just create a couple of new polygons on all of those edges. So I'll invert my current selection and hit Delete on there. And you know, as long as it's a relatively clean mesh, then this should not be intersecting anywhere. So having said that, why don't I let's make this into cloth. So cloth, this is the new cloth system, new in S26. Uh, completely, even though it's going to look similar, you can see the, you know, a lot of these setting names, things like dresser and the cache and everything, they look similar. But it's a completely new simulation system. It's like a particle-based system behind the scenes. And it's perfectly integrated along with the new rope simulations. Like they work perfectly together. So having said that, there we've applied cloth. I want that to collide with the character. And why don't we swap this around and make the shirt blue and the character <laughs> look more look like, look like a mannequin. Uh, anyway, we need this character to collide with the cloth. So I'll turn that into a collider and deselect everything. And let's take a look at that. Hit play. And you'll immediately see, with no changes, it's actually working really well. Like right out of the box, hit NA, get rid of that check out the character. Now, the tricky part here when it comes to doing clothing isn't that the simulation isn't going to work. It's that almost every, you know, I was going through trying to find different animations inside of Mixamo, inside of uh, Maxon has a bunch of, if you didn't know, there's a bunch of motion capture inside here, which is really cool. You see, you know, giant categories of all this different stuff of like pushing things and jumping and running and uh, like a, a whole bunch of loops, really cool. But most of those, when you apply to a character, when the character bends, like, you know, so like, you know, under the arm, it's going to have the polygons pass through each other. So if you have a piece of cloth here, like on the side, and a piece of, you know, another one for the sleeve, and then the arm pinches through, that cloth can't go anywhere except get forced inside the model. So anywhere that the character pinches, right now, it's going to pass inside of the character. And I've been exploring ways to get around that. There's nothing that I'm ready to show yet, but that's something to keep in mind. And in this particular character, even though, like, the arms are working pretty well, like, as he crouches down, let me get the next jump. You'll see as he crouches, like, see how his legs are pinching there and the polygons will be passing through each other? So we've got to be careful about where we put the clothing. So putting something like a cape or something like that would be really easy. Uh, but let's go and make a couple of tweaks here. I would like the shirt, this nice simple shirt. Let's add some bendiness. I'll go pretty high on that and some stretchiness, which is quite high. Hit play and see, you know, immediately you can see it drape way further down, which is nice. 
So now, as he jumps, it's really shaking. Looks, but man, it looks so good so quickly. Um, and then you've got the nice belting tools. So why don't we do that? I would like to, on the shirt, let's right click and add a simulation uh, cloth belt. Keep in mind that we can belt cloth, and, but there's a separate rope belt. And sometimes I click the wrong one and I don't realize it. So definitely use cloth on cloth. So doing that, what do I want this to belt onto? I'd like it to belt onto the character. And what points do I want to belt? Well, I'd like, let's do a loop, UL. We could say like, okay, I want this neck area to stay, you know, kind of stuck to the character pretty well. But let's go overboard right now and like really stick this in the particular spots. So I'm going to kind of loop all the open holes and say, okay, I want those to be belted. So let's say set, and you see these yellow lines get created. And what that's doing is it's finding the closest point on the surface object and saying, okay, that's where I want to be. So you've got the influence, which is uh, how strongly is it pulling there? And I guess I'm not entirely sure what hover does, but setting it that setting it all the way to 100% is probably a bad idea because it's going to pull it really tightly against the mesh. It's kind of like, okay, the mesh is like, well, I want to be here, and the, the shirt's going to be like, well, I want to be there too, and they're going to fight each other. So you want this probably, never make it 100, but even something like 90, 90 would stop it from fighting each other too much. So let, with that on there and relatively strong, we hit play. Actually, I'll just go frame forward. And we should see the shirt kind of pull towards the, the character a little bit. But now you can see how that kind of flapped over. And as he jumps around, it's going to want to stay more stuck to those particular spots. So belting uh, is a very nice combination. Actually, why don't we do that? I'm going to kind of clear out all of that from the character. And let's try putting some sort of cape on the character instead. Um, I wonder if how well we can work from the existing geometry and layer it up on top. Um, so why don't I make a duplicate of that shirt delete the belt, um, and let me select all, D for extrude, so I can make that inflate a little bit more again. Invert, get rid of those extra layers. UL, select that loop. UF, grab this one, invert, so I can delete that. And let me see if there's a couple of loops here that I can delete. Um, that one, that one. And that one. Okay, cool. So you F. So that's going to be the basis of our cape. Delete. And yeah, that's just going to be forming on the character. Um, obviously, we could model it, but I don't want to spend all day modeling during a live stream. And we can decide where we want to pin that again. So why don't I hit the go to selection and just finish selecting these. So we'll just belt it all along the character. And yeah, same thing. Right click, uh, simulation. Uh, cloth belt, what do I want to belt to? Let's belt to the character, set from the current one. And I'm going to start with the influence really high, and we'll see what that does. Uh, and I want this cloth to be like even, like even stretchier. So let's push that, I know, let's go too, this will probably be too far, but we'll just see what happens. And let's make that a different color. Got to be a red cape. OK, so let's see what happens. Hit play. And yeah, instant, oh, the, I still have those bottom points selected, so let me fix that. Rewind, and I'm going to clear that selection and get rid of that one. OK. Rebelt. OK, nice. Now we hit play. And now you can see that it's very stretchy, so even that worked pretty well. Um, as I said, I was probably going to go too far on that. So 25, 35, maybe. It's still pretty long. And OK, that's jumping around. It's definitely escaping through the body where we're layering up those two different pieces of cloth. So let's go into the settings, Some, or yeah, kind of the overall simulation settings. So clicking into simulation, there's two different ones now. There's the old bullet one, the bullet dynamic settings. Completely separately is simulation. So inside of here, we got a whole bunch of different settings. Um, and I don't have a great intuition for a lot of these. I'm starting to learn some of them. An obvious one that we're all kind of familiar with would be the idea of these substeps. So let me jump that up to, say, 40. So we've doubled the number of kind of subdivisions any particular frame will go through to make things more accurate. And we can go to the collision passes and increase that as well. And I've been told polish iterations can help a little bit, but I'm not super familiar. I don't know mechanically what that does yet, so I don't want to speak to it. Um, so let's hit play, see if that works a little bit better. Yeah, he's jumping really hard there, so it's kind of freaking out. It's a nice cape, but let me think of what I would maybe change about that. Let's simplify temporarily, 
just turn off the shirt and see if those two are not like each other. Because I've layered up some clothing and it seems to work really well. Oh, okay, so it's happening immediately on the character. I'm not sure. You know what? Let's go easy on the influence. I did say we don't want to put that up to 100. So I'm going to go, let's try 50 and 50. See what that does. Stretching away. Okay. It, okay, immediately you see that super fix it. So like, I, like as, I, as <laughs> I was just describing, you want to be really careful about having that influence really strong because we they were fighting to get inside the model. The instant I lowered it, now you can see that's actually working really well. So, yeah, let that fall. And then we got the cape. You can jump around, shooting all over the place. Let's make that not quite as stretchy, not quite as rubbery. And there we go. That's actually looking really nice. Um, let's get it a little bit billowy by making a simulation. And we can use any of these forces, except field force. That one's not integrated quite yet. I will add a wind. And you can see the wind is blowing backwards. Uh, it should automatically get applied overall. You'll see if I go back to Control or Command D to get to your project settings. Uh, under simulation, you'll get a giant list of all of the elements that the system is currently looking at. So you can see here that it is indeed seeing the wind. Uh, I have found, though, you have to put the settings up decently high. So hitting this, you won't see too much effect. But let's jump. I, and I'm going to jump it up to 55. And the way I always test, especially in a new system I'm not familiar with, is you don't know what number you need. So I just went from 5. And oftentimes, you might be like, well, OK, let me you know, increase it you know, up to 6, up to 7. But it's like we don't know what that range should be. So I jumped it up to 55. And I, I still don't feel it that strongly. So I'll jump it up to 555. And it's like, OK, now I definitely feel a little bit of wind going back. And so if it still wasn't working, I could increase that again. But now that I actually see an effect, I could say, OK, now I feel like I can double it and maybe get what I want. So now, yeah, now we've got some nice wind blowing straight backward and getting all billowy. Um, it's still really strong, so I'm continuing to think, let's go easier on the stretchiness, easier on the bend, so it stays a little bit better on the character. And the belt, perhaps, should be not that loose. Got to find that right balance there. Uh, and then on top of that, so that's just a wind blowing straight backwards. Let's add on a simulation force and a turbulence. So. The, the turbulence should be adding some nice randomness in. I'll turn the wind off, and we'll see if we can feel the turbulence. So let me crank that scale up. So there's, it's kind of like a giant volume of noise. It's picking different directions to blow. Um, and even though it says a percentage, you can think of this as in almost like literal units. So this is 100 units across, um, 100 centimeters. So typically, you want that to be pretty large. And I'll start increasing the turbulence and see. Yeah, you can see immediately how it's waving around extra. So yeah, turbulence having a big, giant effect. Um, so probably you don't want quite that much. But yeah, just getting a little bit more billowing going. And turn the winds back on. So in general, it's going backwards with a little bit of wind. So yeah, really nice to turn that type of thing on. I'll try turning back on the shirt. But it still might not like being layered on the cape. So basic, enable, unhide. So let's hit play on that. Yeah, OK, yeah, the belt was mostly what was giving some problems. So now uh, we have the shirt and then the cape layered on top of it jumping. And as long as the character isn't pinching through, it's doing a really nice job for us. And even with me cranking up the settings, like it's running pretty well. Um, so is there any follow-ups to this particular thing that we can look at? Or, or should we move on to a new question? But anybody else got something? Burning question? Something about a new feature or no? Well, let me see if we've got something from the internet. Um, can we make, uh, can't we have the connections make the connector, such as a, dynamic, uh, a dynamic rope, as splines? Can we have the connections made by the connector as splines? Mm, OK, I understand. Um, OK, so uh, let's take a quick look at, let's open up a new file. Uh, we, we should make some sort of web of splines. Um, so I want, I'm going to do this both with one of my plugins and without, in case you don't have it. But it's a really good opportunity to show it. Um, let, me, let me think. What should we do as the initial Shape. All right, you know, I'm going to do the, uh, the ricochet one because I was playing with it behind the booth yesterday and it was like crazy fun. So let's talk about a couple of new tools. I'm going to make some text. Let's just say 
Um, what should we type out? I'm just going to do RKT, shortcut for rocket, going to the middle. Now, if you didn't know, in any of the font drop downs in Cinema, you can now click, and at the top we have something called Font Filter. So I can search for, say, Futura and grab this nice bold font and instantly find it. So I know designers have a million fonts, and you're always scrolling and scrubbing and scrubbing, and you shoot past it, and you're like, no, I gotta go back. Now you just search, find it right away. So tiny quality of life things. But you know, a handful of quality of life things can end up being the best feature. But in my opinion, the new Dynamics is the best feature. But that's also a good one. Uh, okay, so we got this text. Let's make it a little bit more depth. And then I want to make a nice mesh out of that so we can feed it into the Volume Builder, Volume Mesher, and hit NB so you can see the polygons. So nice and clean, nice and low poly, um, but we can make it a little bit sharper, get those edges back in. And now if I wanted to control it, I could add in my own smooth, pull back on the power, and we make that as rounded as we want to. Now, the Z Remesher does a great job, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the Volume Mesher is giving us like right, a really nice layout overall. Uh, you know, everything is quads, there's no triangles, but you do end up with like these little pinchy ones, which inside of a simulation might look a little bit weird. Um, and you'll see that it's very much a grid. The best it can possibly be, it's doing a perfect grid from the front. But now we can feed this Z mesher into, I keep saying that, the volume mesher into a remesh. And again, it's going to remesh it really well, but one of the best parts is look at this natural flow it has following the direction of the geometry. Uh, another thing to mention, let me sharpen this up to demo it even better. So with this very sharp text, uh, there's two settings that are amazing. The mesh density, so I can say, okay, I want fewer polygons, wrap it down to 50%, and it becomes lower poly. And the other is this adaptiveness. And if I say I want it really adaptive, what it's going to do is put the polygons where it needs the detail. Uh, let me actually, I want to make this really sharp. So I'm going to increase that more just to demo this feature. As you can see, we get these pretty sharp corners going. Uh, reactivate that, and you'll see, especially somewhere like here, that in the middle it's really flat, so it's like, oh, it doesn't need as many polygons, but over here, it, there's a sharp curve, so it's like, okay, put more polygons over there so it can be sharp. So that's really handy if you want to get the most bang from your buck when it comes to your polygon count. But if you're doing dynamic simulations, and you're going to want everything to be as even and smooth as possible. So the other option is pulling the adaptiveness all the way down, and now you'll see let that update. Now you'll see that this is super even count going all the way around. So it's like the best of both worlds, wherever you want that to be. Um, okay, back to, I'm going to drop that polygon count way down. Let's go like 15. Okay, that looks pretty good. And I would like a little bit of smoothness going on in there. Crank that up a bit. Excellent. Uh, and then I kind of want this text to be slightly intersecting each other. So let me grab the horizontal spacing and just pull those in a bit. Make sure that they are looking good. Okay, yeah, that's gonna make it a little bit easier here. So that is a nice piece of text there. Um, okay, I wanna take this geometry, and again, this is a plugin from Rocket Lasso, and there's the sale going on right now. Um, here's Ricochet. So I think this one is the most fun of the plugins we made because it kind of does something that I can't even imagine how you could do otherwise. So you'll see what's happening is it just looks like a straight spline right now shooting off in the space, and that's going to be traveling exactly a thousand, unit, a thousand units in that direction. Now, I am going to say that I want the source geometry to be not the child, but a remotely linked object. So let's say that that should be looking at the Z mesh or um, the, yeah, the remesh. So now, if I grab this line and I start pulling around to the front, you can see as it strikes the text, it's going to bounce off of it like it's a laser. So bouncing perfectly off there, so that's kind of fun. But where things get interesting is if I drag this inside of the model. Now it's kind of disappeared, but that's because it is now bouncing around inside of it. So what I like to show is let's make that a little bit longer, and it's filling up that space a little bit, but let's add more. So I'm gonna add a zero onto that. Now you see it fills up even more, like calculates really quickly. But let's go crazy and add another zero onto there. And instantly you can see that I filled this mesh up with all these lasers bouncing around, shooting all over the place. And if I zoom way up, you can see how many splines we put in there super quickly. So super fun along those lines. We don't need that many for this demo, so we'll pull back on that a bit. Uh, I'm going to, let's, um, uh, actually, let's not randomize yet. I would like to do this a little bit differently, though. I don't want the laser bouncing around on the inside. I want to kind of wrap it up. So let's pull this to the very tippy top, just barely missing the model. 
And inside of the Ricochet plugin, I'll go to Modify, and I would like to visualize a shell outside of it. So I'm going to, let's make it a little bit bigger than usual. I'm going to set the shell to three, and now you can see that what has happened is there's a blue, a series of blue dots showing you that's where an inner mesh is, and here's a series of orange dots showing you the outside of it. So we are now trapping the spline in between those two. So I'll, I'll also offset this from the surface a little bit. So now it's not touching the model at all, but you can see that it's bouncing around. Let me turn off the visualize. It's bouncing around on the outside of the model, not passing through it anywhere. So let's increase, actually, so the next great feature would be under surface, I want to start adding some alignment because you can see it's kind of like doing these zigzags bouncing around really harshly. So as I, uh, as I add surface alignment, you'll see it's going to start aligning itself with the surface. So as soon as it hits an edge, it starts aligning itself and traveling along the side. So you can get these really nice kind of wrapped up directions. So uh, let's double, maybe even triple, let's do five times. Let's go kind of crazy. Yeah, so we got all these, you know what, I'm going to go even crazier because I think the rope dynamics can handle it. Okay, so you can see we're super wrapping this thing up. Uh, whole thing being surrounded, and I would like to get a nice even series, uh, uh, an equal distance between all the different points that are making it up. So under spline, I'll say I want to enable this spline type. I'll say I want it to be set to subdivided, and what I usually do is j jump this up to 90, and then set the maximum length to 10. So now there should be a new point every 10 away from each other. So that's a nice clean number for us because we're at kind of a nice average scene scale. So having done all that, and we've got this nice crazy spline going, uh, let's drag it down, right click, and add a simulation rope tag to it. And I want it to collide with something, so I'll right click on this and do a simulation collider. So not doing anything else, let me hit play. And currently we're going to be running on the GPU. Okay, actually it's working quite well. So you can see that drops and it's just colliding with the text. I kind of like to put a different material on here just so it can pop out a little bit. So let's make a nice darker material. That will, that will work. Okay, so you can see the splines did a great job. They fell down and they're just kind of dangling there. But we can change a couple settings to make it look better. You know what I'm going to do? Let me try and change this to CPU and see if it runs, how it runs. Well, not much different. This machine seems to have equal power on both. Okay, so currently on the rope, it is kind of, it's pretty stiff overall. The bendiness is at one. But let's jump that to five and see what that looks like. Better. I'm going to go really, let's go crazy with it. First of all, let's give ourselves more frames. And 55. Like I said, I always probably go, I go too far and then pull back if I have to. So these should be super bendy. Excellent. Now you can see that they're really like falling down, um, grabbing all, grabbing over the entire object really nicely. And something I've been enjoying doing is grabbing the friction and putting it down to zero. So now it's kind of only because they're all tangled up with each other that they won't fall off this model. So when I play, you can see they start sliding down, like just instantly. How would you, how would you have made this type of thing in the past? And now just by throwing this rope tag on there, like a rope tag barely tweaked any settings and instantly we're getting this look. So I absolutely love this. Now, if you haven't seen it, we've got the new connectors, which are amazing. So let's step through this really specifically. I would like to add a new simulation connector. And you see it's a nice simple object. There's not very many settings, which is great. And I want this to not connect to different objects. I want it to connect to itself, the same object. Now, what it's going to do is start making connections between the splines. So I'm going to say update live and turn that on and start increasing the radius. And as I increase this, you're going to see these little yellow connections jumping in between them. So it's now saying, OK, that is connected to that, as if they were a single spline. Now, the question that came in was asking if those could be converted into a spline. So that's what started this entire thing. Um, and as I go here, I'm suddenly realizing that I, don't, I can't think of a great way to make those directly connect to each other. I have one thought. You, I mean, as a suggestion to Maxon, it could be great to be like, hey, have a button that will say, like, generate spine from that. And then you know that could then see the connections. That would be great. So there's an official suggestion. Um, on top of that, though, we would have to pre-make those splines, which actually does work really well. I'm just trying to think of how we could actually get them 
to be really close to this model. Um, but you know, for the audience here and anybody watching who's not familiar with these connections, let's take a look at the basics of it. So I've made all these different connections all over the spine. So you saw how it looked before. Did I properly turn off? Okay, yeah, I turned off live update. And now those should be now connected to each other. So when I hit play this time, we should see that they're, you can see how it's tr being treated more like a web. They're, even though there's zero friction, because it's a big net randomly made, they don't want to fall away. So those connect, you know, entirely parametric setup. We didn't make anything editable. We make any change that we want. And it instantly made all those different connections for us. Now, stylistically, we can, if we make the radius smaller here, I'll go back to a live update and start shrinking it. And if we go really small, like 0.4, there's probably going to be a couple of connections. So let's see, with only a few connections, what it looks like. And yeah, you see it's mostly still escaping, but some of them are connected. Now let's do the opposite and increase this and put a whole bunch of connections. So going higher and higher and higher. So now like tons of everything is getting connected to each other. Turn that off, hit play, and yeah, now, yeah, even with more connections, even less is falling away. Now, I'm still trying to think of if there's a way that we could create multiple, like, little connections between them. And I gotta say, nothing is jumping out at me. Um, having said that, we can um, add additional connections from multiple objects. So I'm trying to think of the way, actually, before we go there, I know that those direct connections weren't working too well as a thing, but something that I need to mention is that they added tearing onto splines as well. So if we turn this tearing on, I'm going to leave it default. I'm not sure what a good value would be. But just leaving that on, let's hit play. We should have a decent number of connections. We'll let this fall away. And now you see all of those tear as it falls through. Only a couple are staying behind. So let's increase that number. Uh, just guessing. Let's try 225 and see if that's enough for it not to tear quite so much. Nope, still quite a bit. Let's push it even further. Because I don't know the number, I'll start increasing it to significantly, significantly larger numbers. OK, they're starting to hold on a little bit better. So we're getting into the ballpark. So let's go super crazy here. Now, all these are pulling on each other. So the ones that are actually getting, OK, now we're at the point where they're not tearing. So somewhere in between those two numbers. Nope, looks like we were really close before. Oh, nice. Yep, there we go. That's about what I was looking for here. Um, I guess while we're here, it might be fun. Let's put, <laughs> might be dangerous to do this, but I'm going to push this a little bit further. Instead of this remesh being a something to, col something to collide with, let's turn that into a cloth object itself. So simulation, cloth. And with that being cloth, I'll turn off gravity, control or command D. Simulation, gravity, zero. So now it's not going to fall away. And if I just hit play, I don't think too much will happen. Like everything will settle, the spines will push away from each other where they're overlapping. Give that a second. Whoa, okay. I think something is intersecting, so we'll give that a quick pause. Uh oh. Oop, I got it. Ha ha. When, um, I know typically you want to like hold down the escape key because you can usually escape from something. And I don't know for sure. And maybe I'm just being like superstitious with it. But I also go, it's like, okay, I want to hit play. So don't keep on hitting play like over and over again. Like stop, stop, stop. Because you might stop it, start it again, stop it, start it again. So I always click and just keep holding on it because maybe it's going to register, register the mouse eventually. So just keep that in mind. But I think, I think we've probably got some of the lines in this midpoint like passing through the mesh. So I got to be careful with that. So I, I'm going to backtrack off that and say, let's not inflate that. Um, but let's actually turn that off entirely because I did, you know, I kind of got it in my head to show the cloth here completely separately. I want to show you the inflation. So if I hit play right here, we have just a nice piece of cloth. And it, it's running right now, but because there's no gravity, it's just staying there. So let's turn on this balloon and say, I want it to inflate up. 
So if I click on this, you'll see the entire thing inflates, which is really fun, out of the gate. You can also set this to a small number, like 0.2, and now the pressure is going to shrink and pull in. So the combination of those two things is really nice. And I mentioned it last time, but we've also got this expansion time. So it actually slowly transitions between these, because otherwise it would instantly try and get to this other state and kind of explode. But we can use that exploding to our advantage by, if I say, I want that to expand like quite a bit, and I want it to do over a very short amount of time, I can hit play, and now you see it's going to kind of pop really, really quick. So because it's doing that, I can go and say, yes, we are going to use balloon, but I also want to tear it. So if I activate tearing, let's just leave it on the default and see what happens. So only while this is a volume, only while like the model might hold water with no leaks, can you inflate it, just like a balloon. It, there can't be any holes. So now it's going to want to tear if it gets too big too quickly, if it goes beyond 150%. And the instant it does that, there's a rip. The pressure will go away. So let's see what happens hitting play. I have no idea exactly. OK, so it happened really quick. It's flying away. I want this to shred a little bit more easily. So I'm going to drop that percentage down and hit play. And now, letting that go, you see we've got some really nice tears happening all over the place. Let me get rid of the material so you can see the model. We've got these tears going right through the seams. And a huge advantage to this new system is when the geometry tears, it doesn't what used to happen is the polygons on both sides of the tear would just disappear. But now it creates a new edge for us and keeps both sides of it. And the UVs stick on it perfectly. Everything works. Um, and this is just such a wonderful addition. So yeah, do it, make, making, I always love when, like if I were to just look at this, if somebody were to send me this as a question during a live stream, and be like, how could we make this? In, in 25, I've been like, oh, like I'm not sure how we could make this. Like we'd probably have to model it manually. But here it's like, oh, we just clicked a couple of buttons. There's no keyframes, nothing. And instantly we've gotten this really cool effect. Let's just tinker for a few minutes with some of the settings. Currently the g tear guiding is set to 45. So it's, it's trying to do straight line, you know, kind of straight line-ish things wherever it can. I'm going to put that up to 90. So now it, it's, it's looking to make a 90 degree turn whenever it can. So just rewinding and having only changed tear guiding, I can hit play and you see that it's going to super pop and shred because it's making all those turns. So because of this particular configuration, I think we could increase that tear percentage, the tear threshold. Um, Maybe somewhere in the middle, 122, hit play. Yeah, get the, this lovely, lovely tear drifting away. Like, ah, so cool. Um, something, um, something I would like to show that I didn't get a chance to show how I made it last time is let's play a little bit with some vertex maps and maybe do, maybe do some different, I'm trying to think if I, what? No, let's just make it up as we go. That's the way I like to do it. Brand new file, make a plane, and put it on Z. T for scale, I'm going to make it pretty big. NB, and let's put some subdivisions in. Now, something I was told by Maxon is, all right, let's not go that far. Something I was told is, it's actually, with something like a collider, it is not bad for you to have a decent amount of geometry on it. In some cases, it, it, even, it might make it run faster because it's a particle-based system, and I don't know this for a fact, but if you have some geometry, it's going to be like trying to subdivide that geometry internally. But instead, I kind of did it myself, and now it knows where to put those invisible dynamic particles. It knows where to put them better. So that can be decently subdivided. I'll turn off the grid. I don't like seeing the world... I'm sorry, the work plane grid, just so that it looks a little cleaner for us. And now we also need a piece of geometry, and I want to stick it to the wall, and we're going to do some really advanced things with cloth. So let's make a text object, put that back to the middle. I guess we'll move it to the front there. And let's see, I'm going to go NAB, put that in the middle. Again, I just like a nice big chunky font. Let's just scroll through and see if any of them jump out. Uh, italics? Yeah, why not? That looks, that looks fine. So I want to get this heavily subdivided. And I want it to be really flat. So I'll give it zero depth. So now it's just a single cap on the front. And I want to subdivide it. Well, actually, let me go to caps first. Instead of looking at this as a big, clean end gone, which is great, I want to see the geometry. So I'm going to say, give me uh, a Delaunay subdivision. And inside the caps, I'm going to say, give me all the polygons. So right now, you'll see that there's a whole bunch over here 
because there's a lot of points there to make the curve, but very few points over here because obviously it's trying to create as little geometry as possible. But I want there to be more geometry. So I'm going to go back to the object tab and we have these intermediate points. I'm going to change that to subdivided. And yeah, I'm going to get rid of the angle and say pretty much like every five units along here, create another point. So now we, you see we get this really great kind of random distribution of triangles. Uh, we need to see, uh, scoot this back towards the wall. T for scale, just make the whole thing a little bit bigger. Uh, I'll move the wall a little bit down. I just don't want it to like sneak underneath the wall. That's why it's so big. Uh, close that. And so let's put some, let's just make a very, very quick material here so that the, they jump out from each other. Let's just make it a nice, I don't know. Nice bright green works for me. Okay, now I need to make this editable. Um, when you make, I, I like throwing the text into a connect object and making that editable. It's just quicker than tracking it down inside a series of nulls. We don't need any of these tags. I'll delete all of them and close up the material window. Okay, so now we've got this text. What do I want to do with it? Well, um, let's pin it to the wall. We got a bunch of different things we can do with it. Right clicking and saying simulation cloth. Obviously if I play right now, it's just going to fall straight down. Now something that's cool would be, of course, we could grab a rectangle selection, look at this from the front, select points, make a giant selection of these on the top and say, cloth, I would like to dress this and fix the points. So super quick to be able to just lock those in. But yeah, so we'll do that, hit play. Oop, go to the model so we can actually see it. And I can see those are stuck from the top, super easy to do. Um, but what I, I don't want to do that. I want to clear those out. And let's make a point selection again with regular live selection. And I'll start from Maybe this bottom corner here, that corner right there, and uh, yeah, we'll do the same corner, why not? Okay, so just a couple of points selected on each. Set a selection, so selection, store selection, and I'll just call that um, start. That will work. Now, I need a vertex map. So selection, set vertex weight, zero. So now there's a blank vertex tag on here. And what this tag is storing, every tag is storing some information. What this has done is it is storing a zero to 100% value on every single point. That's all a vertex map is. Uh, it's mapped from red, which means 0%, to yellow, which means 100%. So instead of painting, and if you don't know, you can double click on a vertex tag and you instantly go into the paint tool, which is cool. Um, I'm, I don't want to paint it on manually. I want to use fields, which are an amazing fall-off system inside of Cinema, but it does a lot more than just fall-offs. So I'll delete that freeze, add in this point selection, and the instant I do, you see that those are now yellow. So those are 100%. So inside of our, how do I want to start this? Um, bef I suppose before I even do this vertex map, pretend I didn't do that yet, because I skipped the step, we should pin, I'm going to say simulation, cloth belt. And I want to belt every single point, all of them. I want to belt all of them to the wall. So let's say it should see that, and I click set. And now you can see that there is a yellow line traveling from the model over to the wall. So it's pretty much saying, like, I should be stuck here. So now, with nothing, like I didn't fix any points or anything, if I hit play right now, you're going to see nothing moves at all because it's 100% stuck exactly where it currently is. If I go to the belt, I could lower the influence a bit. So we could say, like, only have 55% influence. And hit play. Actually, you probably have to lower the hover as well. You can see that when I do that, that suddenly is able to move just a tiny bit. And if we start lowering this really far, like five, you can see that now it can start sliding away. So if we kind of find a sweet spot, you can see that it kind of can dangle there. So it's just nice to know that. But I actually want that to be pretty dang stuck. So I'll go 90-90. So it should be really stuck in place. OK, now that we've done that, we can go back to, vertex, back to the vertex map. So you'll see there is a influence right here. And that influence will be, can be fed a vertex map. So 
the vertex map is now saying 100% or 0% in different spots. So where it says 0%, that means it'll have 0% influence. And what happens when it has a 0% influence? Well, that means the entire thing will fall away. So if I put that back to our 90, I can drag in the vertex map. So now when I hit play, you're going to see that only, oop, it didn't like that too much. Let me scoot that. So actually, let's just increase our collision passes a couple. I'll do a couple polish passes, and we could probably get away with extra sub steps. Okay, cool. We'll see if it likes that a little bit better. It is not liking that. Let's see. I did this several times already, so we just got to find the right combination of settings. Hmm. What is it not liking about this one? I've done this before. Mm. Well, one thing, I forgot, oh, I forgot to make the wall a collider. Let's see if that changes anything. I was still freaking out a bit. Hmm. Change it to CPU. Shouldn't really change anything. We'll do two iterations. Drain some more energy out from the scene. It is not liking something here. Let's just do let's just do some simple collisions. We'll give it extra ones of those and nothing else. It's still super jittery. What is it not liking here? Back to the dresser got cleared out. The tag. Let's let that have double quad. So it's got it's t telling it not to bend quite as much. And we'll give it some bendiness and some stretchiness. Hmm. I don't know what it's not liking about this. Something about it doesn't like it, so why don't we just skip to the file I had been playing with earlier. That's a start. I want to skip us to pretty much the step we're on right now. So, go to there. There's the freeze. We got to still build that. Just back to the start points. Freeze the belt. Okay, so now I'll drag that belt in. Okay, we're pretty much in my scene file I was playing with earlier. Um, and now we're back on the same step. So that's what was supposed to happen. <laughs> they just kind of fall and drag and they're properly colliding with the wall and they're just stuck wherever we put those start points. Now in this case, uh, the start points are right there and those get converted into this vertex map so you get that nice solid bit. So hitting play, this entire thing will oops, go to model. This entire thing will just fall from that spot. What's really nice about this setup, and if you didn't know, they updated something in the selection tag of version back where I can just select, let me grab some of these and some right there. Uh, in your selection tag, I can just say update, and now it's updated to these new points. So really nice to be able to do that. Um, okay, so now those should be stuck from the bottom. So I hit play instantly just by changing that. They'll fall down from here. Okay, so now that we're back to where we were before, let's go back into our vertex map. And I want this to spread out over time. So creating a modifier layer called freeze. I would like the freeze to be in grow mode. So what this is going to do is, well, let me just hit play and show you. Set that to add. And we probably have to increase the radius, but let me hit play and see what we get. And we get not much because we have to increase this radius to find, you know, to find out these distances. Typically what I would do is like select two points, pop this out, and I can see right there that they're about 20 units apart. So that's a pretty big one. So now I know 20 is probably a pretty good number. I'll go a little bit bigger than that. Let's type in 30 just to be safe. So what this is going to do is every single frame, it's going to have wherever there's yellow, wherever there is some percentage, it's going to look around 30, within 30 units. And if there's a point there, it's going to say, OK, I want you to get 100% of the effect. So if I play right now, we should see that spread and grow through the entire thing, which is awesome. I would like it to slow down, though. So we can grab the effect strength and say 10%. So now it's only going to apply 10% of the power. So they will more slowly travel through the entire thing. So having done that, let's go and 
look at the model. We know right now that those will be pinned where, um, yeah, we're, we're pinned where they're yellow. So now when we hit play, we see it starts spreading out. But as it's spreading out and growing, it's repinning it back to the wall. So like, oh, that, that, works, that works so well. Let me turn on this cloth nerves so we can actually see it. So it's subdivided in cloth nerves. So gravity is immediately going to drop them down towards the ground, and then slowly the model gets snapped back into position. Like, so much fun, the most basic setup there of, of just doing a simple growth on top of it. Uh, we can modify that any way that we want to. We could start it from the top. We can start it from the bottom. We can invert it. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that I might want to do. We can you know, complicate it in so many ways by putting a noise inside of here. Let me think of if that's even worth it. Right now, just to show you, if I hit play, let me go back to point mode so we don't see it refresh. It, uh, oh, let me select it so it doesn't refresh yet. Okay, so now you can see how that's spreading out. And you see it's a very even spread. A very simple trick to add like a lot more variety to this would be to, let me delete that random field because we're going to make it brand new. Uh, making a n another field, and it's called a random field. So let me set that to normal, and we can see it overriding everything. So now everything's randomly being assigned a value from the random. But uh, we want to kind of see it a little bit more coherently. So selecting our scale, I can crank that up. And as I do, you see how the, the noise has become a little bit more consistent. Uh, I want a crazier noise. Um, when you want crazy noise, Luke is a really good one to reach for. Um, Increase that a little more because Luke is pretty crazy. And um, noises inherently are going to be living a little bit more in the middle gray tones. And I want this to be a little more extreme. So I will go into the remapping setting of the noise field and go down to the contour, change the mode to curve. And now it's remapping the values this way into the slight S curve. We can make that a little more extreme. I can pull this over and make things more red and make them more yellow. And you see we start getting this nice heavy contrast, and that's what I'm looking for. So now we've got a nice heavy contrast. The last thing I would like to do, and it's just a good idea overall, is set some animation speed on it. So let's say 25. And that way, the noise will be slowly transitioning. Let me select that so we can see. As I hit play, that noise is slowly moving over the model. So if one spot was never going to get any influence, it will slowly get some influence. Now, I actually didn't, I, I have literally not ever tried this, but I kind of want to see what happens if we just have this animated noise on here. So if I hit play, different parts of it are going to be getting the influence and pulling it back. So let's just remap it for fun. We know that we want more red overall. So let's select the vertex map, go into the tag, and say, OK, I want to remap this and have less yellow, just a little bit, and start pulling up this red. So now only, only certain spots are going to be getting influence in a given moment. And if we hit play, you'll see how they're slowly moving around, catching different spots. So I'm just kind of curious what this looks like. It could be, it could be a disaster. Let's see. Uh, deselect and hit play. And OK, that's kind of fun. Um, we, if we wanted to calm that down a little bit, there's, an, there's a really great tool inside called, under the modifier layers, we could use a, well, a decay or a delay. I'm thinking let's use a decay. What a, de what a decay is going to do is see a value and remember it. And as it's playing, it's saying, let me keep that value for a while. Now, we could permanently keep it. I could crank this up. Let me show you, because it's really cool. I could crank this up to 100%. Now, it's going to remember if a value goes up to 90, it's going to be like, OK, I remember. I'm going to stay at 90. And if it goes up to 95, it's like, OK, I'm going to remember that now. So the highest number we get to, it's going to keep remembering it. So just so we can see what it's doing, unmodified, I'll hit play here. And you can see how it's going to kind of just randomly spread, because when the noise hits a spot, it's going to remember it forever. So you know that by itself is kind of cool. But what I actually want to do is have it slowly forget. So if I put that to, say, 90, now it's going to remember it for a while, but then fade away. And another thing we could do is you see how these are, as they're moving around, it's just kind of popping in. And that pop effect might not work so well for us. So I'll add on a decay, but there's a mode. Oops, not decay, sorry. I will add on a delay. And there are three different modes, and one of them is smooth. And that means it's going to take a little bit for that value to fade in when it's applied. So you can see instead, let me turn it off. You'll see how these yellows are just kind of popping in. It's kind of like sparkling around. But when I turn on this delay, 
immediately everything feels like it's traveling a little bit smoother. Then we could crank that up a bunch, where these are very slowly going to fade on or off. Or you could just put like a hint of it. So, but I think somewhere in the middle, it's going to do as well. So that, okay, now it feels a lot more organic, kind of drifting around. So having done all that, let's see what the actual effect is going to look like as these are slowly, yeah, now you see it's, it's a little bit more gently getting pulled up instead of like getting yanked. So that's kind of fun right there is this will just endlessly move around, drifting on and off. Sorry, I'm just going on a big tangent here because uh, it is a lot of fun just to play with dynamics. It does simulation stuff in cinema always just turns it into a playground. You can have fun. It's like, oh, well, maybe, maybe later I can make a render from that or use it for client work. But right now I just want to play in, in the new sandbox. Um, anyway, let's go back to some of the stuff we were doing earlier. We've got that random, and I'll return this back to something kind of reasonable with that nice heavy contrast. So where I was going earlier was, so that's it randomly applied everywhere, but I'm going to put this into the radius of the freeze. So as that growth is happening, we're now multiplying on top of it, so the growth, hopefully, will be happening unevenly. So when I hit play, now you can see, instead of it smoothly growing everywhere, let me show you. So here's what we were getting before, a nice smooth growth. But now, turning on the random field, that is going to be randomly jumping, and we get a very different pattern. Now, you see how this one kind of hit a dead end right there? And it's because everything was multiplied, but now it started moving again. And it started moving again because we put that little bit of animation speed inside the random. And that's why I said you want to make sure to have that little bit of random so it gets a chance to keep on growing. Now, because this is multiple, essentially what this is doing is we put this radius of 30 and it's multiplying those values. So if it doesn't have a high enough value, it can't jump to the next point. Um, but because we're multiplying it so much, I would probably increase the radius a bunch so it does get more opportunities to jump, but it, it will jump randomly. So you see that crept up the side really nicely and it's getting up to the top before this one is. So I just like that type of randomness. So yeah, we're back to seeing the overall growth. Let's turn this back on again, hit play. And now we can see the whole thing fall away and slowly more randomly grow. We should see that creeping up the side. So yeah, I just, I like it having that randomness on top. And I, I love that snappiness as it pulls into position. Um, something that could be interesting would be doing the opposite. We want to see it fall away slowly. So the way I would probably do that is duplicate my vertex map. And you always want to rename your vertex map. Don't have them have the same names because uh, the fields identify them by name. So it wouldn't know which one you're referencing. So let's just call that uh, peel. So that should peel away. And inside of this field, I want to delete everything that's inside it. And what I'd like to see from this field is whatever the other tag is doing. So I can drag that in and say, like apply to the nearest one. I can say literally the same index, so one-to-one -one translation. But now that I've done this in a second field, I can very cleanly invert it so we get the opposite effect. So what this is saying is everything is stuck except for where we put the original points. So in this case, I'd like to do the opposite. Or yeah, I, I want this from the top instead of the bottom. So we'll go back to our selection and say, I want to actually select up here near the top. Actually, let's, um, let's do it from the upper corner. And it doesn't have to be from one spot. We can also, let's also do it from here. OK, so update and go back to the original vertex map. And you see that now we've got the points up here. Actually, uh, the freeze is remembering the bottom, so I'm going to say clear. And now you see that only where I just made those new points, are they? Where, you know, that's where they are. If I play here, you'll see those slowly grow from those positions. That is now being fed into the second vertex map, which is inverting it entirely. So now that that is done, I can go into the belt and say, actually, look at that second vertex tag, which is called peel. OK, having done all of that, nice and it's clean. Now we hit play. And now instead of it peeling and going back up again, we have it peeling away from the wall and slowly falling away as the growth continues to happen. Like, I don't know, just how art directable this is, like how much power we have just playing around. And this is just, just a simple example of sticking some text on the wall. We could go, you know, like, there's so many different models and ways. You can imagine this is sticking to a character, like as the character's running, the cape like falls away, but then sticks back to it. And, um, this is like just a very straightforward version, very simple way of integrating it. Uh, we've only got about five minutes, so I can maybe answer one last quick question if anybody has anything. Uh, anything about any of the new features? Any thoughts? Yeah. Like the effect of uh, Venom. 
Yes, okay, so I know exactly what you mean. Uh, the question is, um, the simplest way to say what you're asking would be with these connections, let me get them to show, let's draw them. So there are these connections that have stuck to the wall and you're kind of asking, could we keep on updating them and, and having them jump to new spots? So when this peeled over, could we get to stick to the wall again as it travels down? Uh, I can't immediately think of a way to do that. Like they are, it is a button you have to click and it sets in that particular moment. Now, something we should keep in mind is they are stuck to this wall. They're stuck to a particular spot on the wall. So if we animated the wall, you can imagine that actually being able to go down. So a thought I have, I don't know if it'll work, but we'll see if, it, if we can get it going. Um, we could stick it to multiple, hmm, what's the best way of doing it? What I kind of want to do is add on an additional belt. So let me clear the current belt and select all, and I'm going to deselect a section. So let me just paint away this spot. And we'll belt all of these set. So that's all stuck. Inverting my selection, I want, let's just create a random piece of geometry. So I'll make a plane, put it on Z, T for scale and scoot it behind that area. Okay, make that editable. I think we have to make it editable. I'm gonna make a second belt tag. I'm gonna say this one I want to belt onto, I'm just going, going to call it move. So we're going to move or go to second belt, add on the move object, set the points. So with any, you know, clear, set. So now we got two different things belting in two different spots. Currently, they should all be pretty, st it should be like identical to what we had before. Oh, and it's still peeling away. I don't want it to peel away. So let's select both tags and clear out the vertex map. So it should just be stuck everywhere. So I hit play and I see it, it is indeed just stuck. So if we grab this move plane and put on a couple keyframes, hit play, one, two, three, four, right, right about there is fine. Do it real simple to start out with. I'm just, just, just just scoot that a little bit. And now keep in mind, that would be invisible. We wouldn't be looking at it. And let's hide these, the belting. And I have no idea what this is gonna look like, but let's hit play. And now you can see that one part is stretching over. So you could imagine making like maybe, you know, on each of these letters, on each number, making a couple of those controls and then you know animating it like go here and then go here and then go here and so like grabbing the top of the two and having to do like a little hop and the bottom one do a little hop. So I think that would totally work. Um, but I would also say like again, just like the connectors, it would be amazing if we could, uh, a feature request I would love would having be able to make a new connection if two things suddenly touch. So you can imagine like a, like a web bouncing into a different part of the web and suddenly being stuck. Uh, it would be amazing if we could do the same thing here where you could even potentially just click a keyframe, but if there was some sort of automatic mode of like, oh, I've suddenly gotten close to a different spot, like re-trigger and reset, like that would be amazing. Something to do that um, would be really cool. Um, okay, I think that actually put, puts us perfectly on time. So again, I am Chris Schmidt from Rocket Lasso. We've got that awesome sale going on. And let me just repeat that, I guess. So yeah, we got the sale going on. Head to gumroad.com slash rocket lasso. The best way to support the live streams that I do and the tutorials and everything is to buy a tool that's going to help you do your work and make more money. So 25% off there. Head on over to help. And be sure to follow Rocket Lasso on all the different things on YouTube, Twitch, um, Instagram. Um, what else is there? Twitter. Yeah. So MySpace. <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks, everybody. And hey, thanks, well. Maxon, for having me here. Awesome.